Hello, everybody. Great to have you all here with us today. I'm Joanna Lalikas. I'm the Director of Education here at the Botanical Garden. And we have David Michaud back at the back of the room working with our Zoom audience. And I'm really excited to have this talk about leaving your leaves today. I want to thank Tom Keenan for serving as a Lunchbox Talk host this fall at the long leaf level. And the support helps us um, with program planning, accessibility, and the reach of our Lunchbox Talks. So we have with us today uh, Dr. Karen Stein. And this talk is a partnership with the New Hope Audubon Society. And we, are, we cherish our partnership with New Hope Audubon. Uh, and this is just one way that we partner with some of our lunchbox talks. So Dr. Karen Stein is a retired honors professor of biology and environmental science and former Dean of the School of Sciences at Auburn University at Montgomery. She's moved here just recently to the triangle with us. So glad to have her here. She's also served on the faculty of Ashland University, Radford University and Clemson University. Her areas of specialization are toxicology and environmental science. And she holds degrees from UNC Chapel Hill the University of Virginia, and the College of William and Mary. She's a member of the New Hope Audubon chapter, where she serves on the Leave Your Leaves Committee. So Karen, thank you so much for being with us today. All right, uh, I'm thrilled to be here today. Um, I'm here today on behalf of the New Hope Audubon chapter, and uh, that's the chapter that supports Durham, and Orange and Chatham counties, and also a few parts of other surrounding counties as well. And this Leave Your Leaves campaign is one of our major campaigns this year. This is something we've really been um, promoting. And it's an important part of our mission. And our mission is to promote conservation and the enjoyment of birds, wildlife, and ecosystems. Uh, so today what I wanna do is I wanna tell you a little bit about the program. Uh, I want to tell you what it is, I want to tell you why it matters, and a little bit about the science behind it, uh, and how you can support it. So, um, so we all want to do our part to support the environment. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the times, though, the things that we are, that we really should be doing are things that uh, cost a lot of money or take time out of our schedules, which are already pretty packed. So it's sometimes pretty hard to get people to do those things. And uh, But I want to talk to you today about something you can do that's a good thing for the environment that actually saves you time and money. And so that's a win-win situation. Uh, and all you have to do to do that is to cross a chore off of your list. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit first about why this is a, a good thing, why not raking your leaves is a good thing. And I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about leaves. Okay, so where it all begins, this is the leaf life cycle. So, you know, I don't have to tell you all this because you're here at a botanical garden program, um, but plants are the fundamental basis. They're kind of the ground floor that our whole ecosystem is uh, built on. And the key thing that plants do is they photosynthesize. Uh, what they do in this process, they take energy from the sun and they use that energy to build sugars, uh, which are basically food for the plants, as well as food for organisms, other organisms in the ecosystem that then eat the plants. Um, and the plants that we're going to focus on today are trees, and specifically I want to talk about deciduous trees. So you all know what deciduous trees are. These are the trees that drop their old leaves in the fall and they grow new leaves in the spring. Uh, now what those leaves do, the job of the leaves on a tree is to carry out photosynthesis. Uh, that's where the process takes place. So the sugars are actually built there in the leaves, and then they are transported into the branches and the trunk of the tree for use later on by the tree. So when the days get shorter and colder, photosynthesis shuts down, all right? The leaves stop making chlorophyll, uh, and chlorophyll is the main pigment that's involved in photosynthesis. So the leaves stop making that, uh, and the existing pigment starts to break down. But there's other pigments in the leaves as well. 
Uh, and these other pigments have several functions. They actually help absorb excess light and prevent the leaves from being damaged because although light is critical for photosynthesis, too much light is actually a bad thing. Uh, these other pigments also function as something called antioxidants, which you may have heard of because that's important for all living things. There's um, chemicals out there that are called free radicals and those can do a lot of damage. So some of the pigments in the leaves help protect the leaves from free radical damage. Um, so basically these are protective. So as the chlorophyll breaks down though, uh, these other pigments become more visible. There's carotenoids, which are yellows and oranges, and, and these break down more slowly than chlorophylls. They will break down eventually. You'll notice the leaves will become brown, uh, but they break down more slowly. And so you get these nice fall colors. Um, there's also anthocyanins, oranges and reds in the the synthesis of those actually gets kicked up a little bit in the fall. So that's what produces all those really nice fall colors that we've been enjoying. Now, <clears throat> besides the leaves changing color, of course, they fall off. Uh, what happens is the trees begin to block new growth and they step up the production of hormones that actually will, will cut off the leaf, will, will cause the leaf to fall off of the tree. It will detach and fall to the ground. So, do you ever wonder why trees do this? Now, this, this seems like this is kind of a waste, right? Because you're gonna take the leaf, you're gonna drop the leaf, and what are you gonna have to do in the spring? You're gonna have to start all over again and grow all new leaves. Well, even though it seems like it's a lot of work, it's actually really important for the tree to do because it helps protect the tree from winter conditions. If you look at leaves, they're flat and skinny, right? They've got a lot of surface area. This is really good for photosynthesis uh, because you need to get sunlight in there and you need gas exchange and all of that, but it makes the leaves really, really vulnerable to freezing and winter damage. So uh, if leaves are on the tree during freeze, that can cause some serious damage to the leaves. So if the tree tried to hold on to its leaves during the winter, what might happen is when spring comes and photosynthesis goes to kick up again, what's gonna happen is the tree is gonna be stuck with a lot of damaged leaves and that is not gonna be a good thing. So trees, deciduous trees have evolved this mechanism that allows them to drop their leaves, cut their losses, drop their leaves in the fall, and then they can make nice new undamaged leaves in the spring when the days get longer and the temperatures get warmer so that they can start up with photosynthesis again. So, so that's the reason why all of this happens, why this goes on. Now, what we're interested in today though is talking about what happens to the leaves after they hit the deck, after they're dropped from the trees. And so I wanna talk about that Next, where do the leaves go? So what happens to the leaves when they fall? So after the leaves hit the ground, they form a leaf layer. And this layer can be up to several inches deep. And those leaves in the layer are actually not finished with their usefulness to the ecosystem. Uh, in fact, they are just going to transition to another role in the ecosystem. And over time, leaves will break down or decompose. They will break up into their component parts. Uh, and this process is actually helped along by a number of other members of the ecosystem. Uh, there's a lot of bacteria that help break down leaf litter, and that would include some that you may have heard of, uh, Streptomyces and Bacillus and Pseudomonas species. So bacteria play a role in this. Fungi play a really important role in breaking things back down and, and returning the components to the ecosystem. Uh, what fungi do is they're actually very cool. They secrete enzymes that break down organic matter and then they take the nutrients back up again. Um, these fungi include rhizopus species. Uh, that's black bread mold. I don't know if you've ever seen that, um, as well as penicillium species and others. So there's a lot of fungi out there that are breaking down leaves and other organisms play a role too, particularly breaking the leaf down mechanically into smaller parts. Um, earthworms, beetles, millipedes, uh, snails, they all break up, they consume organic matter, and then they themselves are sometimes consumed, returning lots of nutrients to the soil 
And the result of all of this action is over a few months after the leaves fall, the leaves release lots of organic and inorganic compounds into the soil. And a lot of those can be taken back up by the tree the following spring and used to build new leaves. Uh, they can also be used by other organisms that inhabit the ecosystem. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But the overall result of the decomposition process is to improve soil content and texture. And if you're a homeowner, what that can do is it reduces the need to produce and or to purchase and apply fertilizers. So, so this, is, this is a good thing. So I sometimes get questions about pine needles too. Um, so if you've got pines, you know it's certainly through pines don't drop their needles the way that deciduous trees do. Well, they don't do it all at once, typically. Uh, pine needles last a little bit longer. They've got a lifespan of a few years because they're so skinny and they're covered with this really nice cuticle. They don't suffer the kind of winter damage, but they do get dropped eventually. Uh, the pines will cycle through it. Uh, they break down more slowly, but they actually make a great mulch too. There used to be a story going around that uh, you shouldn't mulch things with pine needles because it will make the soil acidic. Uh, and it turns out that's not true. Pine needle mulch does not actually make the soil acidic. Uh, the, the relationship between acidic soils and pine needles is that pines grow best in acidic soils. And so you tend to find pine trees in acidic soils and they drop their needles and it's not the needles that make the soil acidic. It's the acidic soil that's responsible for the pines being there in the first place. So if you've got pine needles, that's fine too. You just don't wanna layer them too thickly so that they don't block water getting to the soil. But so you can use deciduous leaves, you can use pine needles also. Uh, and the bottom line is it greatly improves, again, the soil texture and, and reduces the need to apply fertilizers. So another thing that leaving your leaves does, although you may not have thought about this, is it improves water quality. Um, a healthy leaf litter layer reduces water runoff. Uh, it allows water to soak into the soil instead of uh, in contrast to hard surfaces like grass and, and uh, you know, other surfaces that allow the water to just run off. Um, a nice thick leaf layer can hold up to two inches of rain, uh, preventing it from becoming runoff. So that's a good thing. And it really helps reduce the flooding from stormwater uh, during periods of heavy rainfall. Uh, in addition, if leaves get blown into the street, they can block gutters and they can cause problems with drainage systems. And in terms of water quality, there's an issue with water quality as well. When you get too much organic material like leaves into water, into streams and waterways, you get a condition that's called eutrophication. Um, you may have seen eutrophic bodies of water. They're the ones with the big thick green mat of algae across the top. So, um, the reason this happens is in aquatic systems, there's something called a limiting nutrient that usually limits the growth of algae. This is often nitrogen or phosphorus. And so algae will grow until they run out of nitrogen and phosphorus. Now what happens, both of these things are contained in leaf litter. So when leaves get into the aquatic system, it adds more nitrogen and more phosphorus, and that allows algae to bloom, to grow even more. Um, and then that's when you get these big, thick, unsightly mats of algae on the surface of the, of the body of water. But that's not the whole story. Um, also, when that algae dies, it sinks to the bottom of the body of water. Uh, and uh, the microbes that break it down use a lot of oxygen. So not only do you have these mats across the surface, you also have microbes down churning and using up all of the oxygen. And that leads to um, low oxygen levels in the water. And low oxygen levels can have a significant impact on the kind of life that can live in those bodies of water. Um, also, to add in global warming, the warmer the water, the less dissolved oxygen it can hold. So overall warming of the planet is contributing to this um, as well. 
So eutrophication can be a problem when leaves get into the waterways. I'll also just mention that the overgrowth of algae and other organisms, including organisms, little guys called cyanobacteria, uh, can also be associated with some other issues as well. Um, I have to throw this in because I'm a toxicologist and cyanobacteria can produce some pretty nasty toxins. And there is some evidence that cyanobacterial toxins may be linked to um, human disease as well as uh, ecosystem issues. So, uh, so the bottom line is keeping the leaves on the land and out of the water also helps promote water quality. So in addition, the leaf layer also has benefits for wildlife. And to talk about this, we get to talk about insects a little bit. Um, like trees, insects have to prepare for the coming winter, all right? Now, some insects got around the problem. Um, monarch butterflies, for example, they just migrate to someplace warmer, and so, so they don't have to deal with it. But other insects stay behind, and I don't know if you've ever wondered how they survive through the winter. Um, well, what they do is they hunker down somewhere where they are protected from uh, the harshest winter conditions. And quite often, their location of choice for hunkering down for the winter is the leaf layer. Um, so you probably know a little bit about insect life cycles. So insects start out as eggs, all right? And some insects hatch out into what are called nymphs. And these look pretty much just like smaller adults. And the nymphs may go through a number of, of cycles called instars until they finally become an adult. Um, but they don't really change their basic form. Other insects, though, uh, go through this really cool and dramatic change called metamorphosis. And in metamorphosis, they basically break down everything and restructure themselves into something completely different. Now, they also start out as an egg when they go through metamorphosis, but the egg hatches out into something called a larva. Uh, and that's the big growth stage for the insect. That's where the insect does most of its growing. Uh, and it's usually kind of an advantage because the larvae usually eat different food than the adult does, so they don't compete with each other. Um, and the larvae eventually will encase itself in a protective covering uh, to enter what's called the pupil stage. And that's where all that dramatic change in body structure takes place. Uh, all the old structures are broken down and I know, out of the sort of the mush, a whole new adult emerges. So what does this have to do with leaf litter? Again, a lot of insects overwinter in the leaf litter. Um, some moths and butterflies will overwinter as caterpillars, which is their larval stage. Um, woolly bear caterpillars, everybody knows the woolly bear caterpillars, right? Um, they hide away all winter in the leaf litter and in the spring they will emerge and uh, they will form a cocoon and emerge as an Isabella tiger moth. Um, swallowtail butterflies overwinter in the leaf litter in the form of a chrysalis. Uh, that's their pupil stage. It's basically the butterfly version of a cocoon. Uh, also, a lot of pollinators will hibernate uh, in shallow holes, either in or underneath the leaf litter. Um, bumblebee queens, for example. Uh, and everybody's favorite, fireflies. Now, everyone likes seeing fireflies in the summer. Um, but if you want to see a lot of lightning bugs in the summer, you need to give the larvae a safe place to overwinter. Uh, and fireflies are in trouble. There's several species are currently at risk for extinction. And habitat destruction is one of the big factors, uh, along with light pollution and pesticide use, neonicotinoids. That's a whole other story. Um, but by leaving your leaves, you can do something. You have the opportunity in your yard to help fight at least one of those battles to keep the fireflies um, with us. And as I'd already mentioned, there's other insects too, millipedes, earthworms, beetles, all depend on leaf litter to release the um, nutrients that they need for survival. So 
Many of these insects also play another role in the ecosystem, and that's as food. So uh, those overwintering insects are also a very important part of the food web. They provide nutrition for many other types of wildlife, including birds. Birds like um, eastern bluebirds, white-throated sparrows, and more. In fact, 96% of all terrestrial bird species feed their young on insects. So, and that requires a lot of insects. Spring caterpillars are a primary food source for baby birds. Uh, and without the leaf litter layer, there wouldn't be nearly as many insects available to feed the birds in the spring. <clears throat> How many bugs do you think it takes to raise a brood of young birds? Somebody did a study, okay? So some scientists from the University of Delaware did a study that determined that it took between 5,000 and 9,000 insects to raise one brood of baby chickadees. 5,000 to 9,000 insects, and we're talking about one nest of birds. That's a lot of insects. So, um, and other wildlife, uh, turtles, chipmunks, salamanders, uh, and more, also depend on the insects that are found in the leaf litter for a big part of their diet. So um, the, the bottom line is that deciduous trees and insects and birds and other organisms all evolved together and they are interdependent. So um, leaving the leaves allows the ecosystem to function as a whole the way that it should, the way that it evolved. But not only can leaving your leaves help your local ecosystem, it can actually help the global ecosystem as well. So climate change. Well, there's no getting around it. Leaves are going to break down. No matter what, leaves are going to break down. But there turns out that there's a big difference in the location in which they break down. Uh, and that the big difference hinges on whether or not oxygen is available for the breakdown. When leaves are allowed to break down in place in the leaf litter, uh, there's plenty of oxygen available. And this is a situation that's called aerobic decomposition. Um, now you do get carbon dioxide released in this process. There's no way of getting around that, but much less carbon dioxide is released in aerobic decomposition than in the alternative, which is something that's called anaerobic decomposition. So anaerobic decomposition, as you might guess, is decomposition that happens in the absence of oxygen. Um, and where does that happen? It happens in landfills, because in landfills, they pack in layer after layer after layer, and the little microbes that live in landfills and carry out decomposition are anaerobic methanogens. They produce a gas called methane. And um, methane producing organisms live strictly in anaerobic environments. And methane is very bad for global warming. Methane gas can hold up to 25 times the amount of heat as carbon dioxide. So, so anaerobic decomposition is pretty much a bad thing. And by the way, more carbon dioxide is, is produced in anaerobic decomposition too. Um, so altogether, sending leaves to the landfill is way worse for global warming than allowing them to, to um, break down in place. Uh, and according to EPA data, yard trimmings, which includes leaves, uh, accounts for around 8% of the waste in landfills. And you can do your part to reduce that uh, percentage and help mitigate global warming at the same time. And there are other environmental benefits as well. So by leaving your leaves, you can reduce local pollution as well. Um, noise pollution. Um, everyone's heard leaf blowers, right? Uh, so according to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the sound of leaf blowers can expose users to not only immediate pain, but also long-term damage to hearing. So commercial leaf blowers will run at about 80 to 85 decibels. Cheap leaf blowers or mid-range leaf blowers can expose users up to 112 decibels. And just for a point of comparison, a plane taking off, 105 decibels. So louder than a plane taken off. 
Um, you can also reduce local air pollution. Uh, the two-stroke engines that are in gas-powered leaf blowers release about, three, release about 300 to 500 times the level of hydrocarbons as do vehicles on the road, uh, and about 25 times as much carbon monoxide. Uh, and again, just for a point of comparison, running a gas-powered leaf blower for an hour releases a level of pollutants equivalent to those released by driving a car over a thousand miles, like from LA to Denver. So a lot of pollution produced by these machines. And they produce a lot of particulate matter into the air. Both gas and electric leaf blowers can send particulate matter into the air where it can travel considerable distances. Um, uh, Gas-powered leaf blowers also release 50 times the particulate matter as vehicles on the road. Um, particulate matter is really, really a, a very bad form of, of air pollution. Uh, it can include anything from animal feces, pesticides, chemicals, uh, heavy metals, uh, um, allergens, pollen, mold, and all of that. And evidence is mounting that small particles, small particulate pollution plays a very significant role in human health, um, including contributing to lung disease, to heart disease, and even to neurological disease. So you know, particulates are, are really bad news. And there are a lot of people out there that are particularly susceptible to particulates and problems caused by dust and particles, which include people suffering from asthma, small children, the elderly, and so forth. So, so not running a leaf blower, again, good for your local environment. And finally, leaving your leaves saves you, the homeowner, time and money. Um, it saves you the cost of paying the municipality to pick up your leaves. And if you happen to live someplace where leaf pickup is subsidized, um, it's saying saving taxpayer dollars uh, for your city can use to do other things. Uh, it reduces your need to fertilize your property by keeping all those valuable nutrients that are locked up in the leaves there on site. You can feed the trees, you can feed your other plants uh, without spending a dime. Uh, it also means you don't have to pay for and haul in bags of malt from your local big box store. And you don't have to do all of that blowing and raking in the fall. So you can just relax. So now what can you do with your leaves. So the easiest and best thing to do, nothing. You can just leave them where they fall. But I know a lot of you will have grass and areas you need to maintain. You can't just leave leaves on top of grass or it will kill the grass. So if you've got areas of grass that you need to maintain, you've got a couple of options. If you have a mulching mower, you can mulch your leaves. Um, you can also just gently rake or blow your leaves with an electric blower, hopefully, to around the base of your trees and shrubs. So the area that extends out under the farthest branches of the tree is called the, the drip line or the critical root zone or the root protection zone. And that's a perfect area to rake your leaves to, particularly the leaves that have fallen from that tree, because they're going to have, again, exactly the nutrients that the tree is going to need to rebuild leaves in the spring. You do want to leave the base, the very base of the tree uncovered. Um, that's the part where it flares out just above the, the soil line. That prevents disease and damage to the tree, but you can rake all around the rest of that uh, drip line zone. You can also rake your leaves into your perennial borders, which hopefully have a lot of native plants in them. There's another, <laughs> that's uh, another thing you can do for the environment. Or you can compost them along with grass clippings and other yard materials. So there's a lot of materials out there on how to carry out effective composting. Composting leaves makes a nice, dark, rich, earthy, organic matter that you can use to add nutrients to your garden soil. Uh, leaves can be a great addition to a home compost pile too, because you can keep a pile of leaves next to the compost and then alternate it with kitchen scraps and, and things like that. And again, there's a lot of resources out there on how to carry out effective composting. And home composting is typically an aerobic 
process. So uh, although with composting, the downside is you don't get that natural layer of leaf litter for protecting the insects. Um, you also don't get the methane production that you would get with anaerobic decomposition like you'd find in a landfill. So if you just can't leave the leaves out, composting at the home is definitely a, a better option. Okay, so to sum up um, all of this, so leaving your leaves improves soil health uh, and allows trees to take those nutrients back up again. It slows water runoff, also helps the tree retain moisture. Uh, leaving your leaves helps protect the insects, sustains insect life, provides food for birds and frogs and turtles and other wildlife. Uh, leaving your leaves helps with slowing climate change. It reduces local air pollution and water pollution and noise pollution. And it provides cost and time savings to homeowners. So what it's really all about, it's about configuring our yards as best we can to work with the natural ecosystem instead of, of against it. So, so how can you participate? All you have to do is leave your leaves. Um, but if you'd like to, uh, you can use this QR code to access a website where you can make a pledge to do your part and leave your leaves. Um, every yard matters. And again, it's not only about your own yard, but it's also about helping to change the perception about what's normal for yards in general. Okay, we'd like to see it where this is the, the, the norm of doing things like this. So in conclusion, um, on behalf of the New Hope Audubon Society, I would like to thank everyone for coming. Uh, I'd also like to recognize our partners in this project, uh, uh, the Triangle Community Foundation and Keep Durham Beautiful. Uh, the project was made possible thanks to a grant from the Fund for the Triangle, Support for the Environment of the Triangle Community Foundation. So uh, at this point, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Hello, everyone. So we do have a, a question or two online. I'd like to ask our in-person audience first. Do you all have any questions you'd like to ask? Um, with this initiative, how are you going about like talking to like homeowners associations and things like that? that might have specific guidelines what? for neighborhoods. Yeah, yeah. and that's a great that's question awesome. because, you know, property oh. management associations, HOAs and all of that, we're trying to do our best to get them on board with this because people can't do this if they're not allowed to do it. We are, um, this is a fairly new initiative, but, but we are just trying to get out there. And for one thing, we're willing to talk to anybody who wants to hear us. And so we have a website out there and on the website you can, there's a short video, but you can also request speakers and we will send people out to talk to any group we, uh, and, and we're just, we're the signs make a difference. I think you had mentioned you've got a sign, we have signs out there. Uh, and so hopefully what we wanna try to do is just get the information as much out there as possible. And again, get it to snowball where it's a, you know, it becomes the norm. And we have talked about trying to reach out and talk specifically to some HOAs and, and such, because we do recognize that's, you know, that's an issue. I live in a place where they blow the leaves with gas plows and, and, and I haven't had a chance to get on that yet, <laughs> but I will be speaking to them about that. But that's a great question. Great, thank you. David, do you have some online? I do. Um, so you mentioned that leaves decomposing in a backyard compost pile um, are, that, that's aerobic uh, breakdown. Is that the same at larger composting facilities? It depends. <laughs> it depends on the composting facility. Um, there are some larger composting. There's debates about aerobic versus anaerobic composting, and some facilities run aerobic and some anaerobic. And and so it just that's a great question, and it just depends on the facility. So if you're concerned about a facility, the thing to do is ask the question. Ask them whether they're doing you do aerobic, <laughs> you know, composting, or do you an, do anaerobic? When you leave the label. Please, what happens? Do you, do you get 
oak trees coming up or do ground covers ever penetrate or how, how does that work? Well, when you leave the leaves, it's basically it 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 leaves that that nice you know leaf layer and it will break down eventually. So do things come up underneath it? They can. Uh, again, grass not so much, you know, to, it blocks the light too much, but it works pretty much just like any kind of of mulch, of mulch material. You know, it will last for a while and then it will eventually break down. Another one from the Zoom audience. Uh, can you end up leaving too many leaves on gardens if under a huge deciduous tree? That's it, you can. It is possible if if you get. I think most places recommend a two to four inch layer, about like that. Uh, if you get too many leaves, it is possible that with rain and such, they'll pack down and 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 prevent water from getting through and and all of that. So so yeah, I mean a huge a huge pile would not be great for if you're trying to use it for you know for mulching for. You know, for composting, that's a different thing. But uh, yeah, for mulch, you want a few inches. Thank you for that. Um, another viewer, having a creek and storm drain next to their yard, what are the best practices to make sure to keep their leaves from blowing into these spaces to protect waterways? That's a great question. And it's a hard one to answer without seeing the actual set up without seeing exactly what's going on. I, I would think what you might want to do in that case would be if there are areas of the yard away from the storm drain, this is where you could, could rake to a bed that's or or compost someplace away from there. I understand that definitely is, is a potential problem. So you would just have to kind of work around it or 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 potentially, I don't know if you could put up some sort of barrier to keep leaves from blowing in, but again, kind of hard to answer without without actually seeing the <laughs> seeing the, the setup. Right. Another viewer uh, has a small pond in their yard. Um, it sounds like you recommend removing the leaves that fall in that pond to preserve the water quality, is that correct? To some extent, yes. It, it's the more leaves that go into the pond, the more eutrophic the pond will get. So if there's a way of, of, of reducing that, that will slow the process. I do have to, I do have to be honest though. All ponds eventually become eutrophic. Everything becomes eutrophic with time. So it's if, if you have a pond, it's not possible to completely stop that process but but absolutely if you have tons and tons of leaves going in there you know if you if you skim them out that that will slow it down um i think you alluded to this earlier uh, but years ago people were advised to run over the leaves with the mower rather than rake is that still the, the current practice it's it's not i mean the the sort of the gold standard would be leaving them where they are because that leaves the the cover for the insects and all of that kind of thing but I mean we recognize that's not feasible for every part of the yard and for every person so is it better to mulch them than to send them to the landfill absolutely so so that would be you know that that's still head and shoulders better than than the, the worst is the landfill with anaerobic decomposition so so yeah you know it's fine to mulch them if you know, if you don't have any good place to rake them to and, and you've got grass, you've got to protect, mulching is fine. When in the spring should you tidy up your yard? Your yard? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I, I would guess, I know, my, my sort of best guess at it would be, you would start to tidy up your yard as things start to poke up, you know, as, as your your perennials start to come back and and such like that and grass starts to green up and all of that but that's my best that's when I do it so all right. if anyone else has more information to add go for it sure. um and one more um 
Are, are you saying that personally composting leaves is potentially as good as leaving the leaves if, 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 rather, rather than going, going to the landfill? It's it's better than going to the landfill, probably not as good as, I mean, I think for most people, realistically, you might have a combination of things, you know, for your yard, you would have some areas where you could rake it up, rake up the leaves from mulch, and, and you might have some areas in which you would have to, um, Know, mulch it with a mower and, and maybe you've got a composting pile in back where you put the excess so it's not necessarily a well we have to pick one of these things and we have to just do that um you can pick different areas of your yard to, to do whatever seems best for that particular area but all of those things are are better than sending the leaves to the landfill for anaerobic decomposition <laughs> I think we've captured most, if not all, of those questions. And I want to thank you, Karen, so much for being here today and sharing all of this great news for us to leave our, our leaves. leaves. And thanks, thanks everybody for being here. Thanks to our Zoom audience for being here. And we do have some upcoming lunchbox talks, talks in, in January, January and February. February. We're hoping to schedule one in December. So stay tuned on that for the Zoom audience. Uh, you'll get a uh, registration link in your follow-up email, as well as folks who registered who are here today. So join me in thanking Karen for her presentation.